what's up everybody we're live with adam swab sorry we just had a couple technical difficulties and i'm seeing that obs it's still acting up but we shall fix this in no time which is fixed done um i hope everyone is having a good time everyone had a, a good day it's a uh, the holiday seasons um a lot of you guys are just wrapping up your last projects at work uh and i hope all of that is going well uh adam how you doing i'm doing great i'm on vacation till the end of the year so <laughs> i'm happy that's pretty awesome man um today we have the launch of your new course i'm just going to open up twitch to see if everyone is hearing us clean and and that everything is going well with the chat and for anyone in the chat mache is there with you guys um to answer any questions you might have so feel free to post them as soon as uh yeah as soon as they pop up in your mind um to get started adam i'm just going to play your trailer and uh Hi, I'm Adam Swab. I'm a creative director and visual effects artist, and I've been working in films and commercials for over 15 years. Working with particles in Houdini can be both challenging and rewarding. By the time you finish the class, you'll be able to create incredible simulations that would be impossible using keyframes alone. To get started, we will build our own particle system in Houdini from scratch. You'll learn the mechanics and fundamentals of particle dynamics and how they react to various forces. From there, we'll study Houdini's built-in tools and develop methods to choreograph and art direct our systems. Finally, we'll explore a variety of rendering and instancing strategies. Understanding these systems might seem complicated, but it doesn't have to be. For this reason, I've designed the course to quickly get you up to speed and help you fully understand the ins and outs of particles in Houdini. Sign up today and begin your journey at LearnSquared.com. Pretty awesome. Um, for those of you who don't know, this is uh, actually the second course uh, we've had with Adam. Um, Adam, do you want to, you know, introduce yourself, talk about the first course you, you did with Learn Squared and uh, what this new course is about? Sure. Hey, everybody. Hopefully a few of you know me and have Hi. subscribed to the first course and got through all the lessons in that and are proud and happy to move excuse me, move on to the second one. The first one was my way of getting people introduced to Houdini, people who were curious about it and hadn't used it before, and really take a systematic approach to getting people comfortable and familiar with the program and some of the concepts in there. And for me, that was a foundation that we could start to build upon. And after that foundation, what I really wanted to do was start getting into some really exciting stuff and some stuff that people are you know, really wanting to do Houdini for, which is particles, and bring all of the you know, knowledge that I have for particle systems, because I've done tons and tons of particle projects in Houdini over the last few years, really just share that knowledge with everybody and give people a really great foundation for learning this stuff. Um, there's really not a ton of, I'd say, not a ton of really great material out there for learning this, at least learning this in the level that I'm teaching it, which is, you know, I think pretty extensive and covers almost anything that you would really want to know about particle systems and uh, getting you feeling like you got a good handle on it um, in more than just like I can emit particles and I can make them hit, hit something. It's about, you know, understanding how solvers work and understanding how to art direct stuff and really getting specific about what you want and what you're trying to achieve. So to me, this is going to be a really amazing class. Uh, it's going to be dense. It's going to be full of really good tips and tricks. Um, okay. But yeah, I guarantee you're going to come out of this with knowledge that you absolutely are not going to get anywhere else. Like whenever we think about particle simulations, um, at least in the motion graphic industry and everything, the first thing that comes up is X particles. Um, and, and generally, it always feels a little bit intimidating because you sort of have to put together systems and and all sorts of mechanics to start having like these really um, impressive uh, sort of results. How 
first of all, in terms of requirement, how much do I need to know about Houdini to start like how, like producing stuff in, in your course? Yeah, you're definitely not going to succeed in this if you haven't opened the software before. So okay. you definitely have to have familiar with the software. To me, going through that first course of mine is not a requirement, but it's pretty recommended because again, I'm building on some of the stuff that we did in that first course. Mm -hmm. Um, but if, I mean, if you're of a sufficient level that you feel that's not necessary, you could jump right in. You do have to have some comfortability with, uh, you know, expressions and channels and a little bit of vex and bops. Um, we cover some of that in there. I try not to make it too intimidating. Um, a little bit of some programming knowledge helps a little bit just because the first lesson we we do a bit of stuff in code. Um, I do go and explain everything, but it might be a little intimidating if you haven't done that before. But a lot of that is, again, it's not something you have to follow right along with. It is something that's good just so that you understand what's going on in the sense that we're building an entire particle system okay. and solver completely from scratch in the first one. So it's not even using the Houdini particle system. We're actually going and writing our own system so that we really understand the mechanics of what's happening. Um, so a little bit of, of scripting helps, but again, it, that's not really required. And I tried to approach the class as if you hadn't done scripting before. Okay. Um, and when you, yeah. when you say scripting, is it like, is it a specific language or is it just something that's uh, specific to, um, Houdini itself. We're using Vex in Houdini, but Vex is a language that's really similar to C++. Um, you know, Python again is just formatting in mm -hmm. terms of the difference. It's not, it's not really a huge, um, yeah. Yeah. It's not, not going to be like a crazy thing. And I see that Sir John's online as yeah, well. And Sir is. John could probably tell you whether it was intimidating for him or not. I know it was, but uh, he might be able to offer his perspective in that. Yeah, and and just as as someone who who just started dabbling in in Python and like most of these softwares, whether it's Houdini, Touch Designer, and all that, generally don't require high level of coding. Like they just you just need to sort of understand the basics to to be able to sort of call upon. Uh, specific things like that's at least my my experience in other softwares but I'm guessing it's the it might be the same in in Houdini and if that's the case it's basic basic coding skills generally yeah it's basic coding you know knowing how to do loops and knowing how to write functions and stuff like that okay. um, super basic but you know I tell people who are afraid of coding that if you're not willing to write a single line of code or even two lines of code, that you're going to hit a wall pretty quickly in Houdini just because you really need it. You need to know how to do some of that stuff. And um, coding is not something where you have to get overly technical about it. Mm -hmm. All it is is just, you know, writing automation tools in that sense. Like it's a few exactly. lines of code that writes a loop that does a thing. And again, we try to make it very logical about how it's laid out. Mm -hmm. um, and then what I also tell people is I learned to code from this book called Learn C++ in 21 Days, which I think was a really great book when I picked it up okay. more than 10 years ago. And I never got past day eight. So if you were really motivated, you could learn everything you needed to know about coding, period, in probably, I'd say, five or six days. Mm -hmm. You know, And to me, that's a really small investment in something that's going to be a useful tool for you for the rest of your career. Um, and personally, I feel like if you're getting involved in, in visual effects and even motion graphics, having some coding experience and understanding what it is, is incredibly, incredibly helpful to you. Cool. Um, one question people were asking when we started, uh, announcing the course was what, basically what version of Houdini uh, do you need to to basically follow uh, your course? And is there, can you do it with Houdini Indie, uh, any of those? Yeah, you can use any licensed or apprentice version of Houdini, starting with version 16. And we go, version 16.5 was just released, I think, last month. 
Um, and it doesn't look like they changed too much uh, in terms of what we're doing here. So it's pretty relevant still. I, I didn't see anything that stood out to me as a red flag of like, oh my God, they totally changed that, which anybody who's been using Houdini for a little while knows every uh, point release, they do something which reinvents some major tool in there. Um, so that gets a bit frustrating when you're preparing learning materials for people, but it seems pretty constant right now. And particle stuff hasn't really changed since I think version 13. Okay. Um, yeah, so it should all be pretty good. All right. Um, we're just going to look at the different lessons. So the course is divided in four lessons. The first one being time-based solvers, lesson two, intro to particles. So you actually start looking at particles, I'm guessing, after you've you've gone through like uh, some some fundamental uh, knowledge in lesson one. Can you actually talk about how you how you've broken down the different lessons? Yeah, so time-based solvers. The first thing I wanted to do is take you into the SOPS context, and that's the the building context, uh, the non-simulated environment. And they have a tool in there called a solver SOP. And solver SOP is really interesting because it is a tool that remembers the previous frame's history and stores it in memory. Okay. And because you have this tool that will remember what happened on the frame before, you can use that to make your own solver in your own simulation environment and you can make it do kind of limitless things if you see people doing these like growth and propagation effects and some of the stuff that simon holmdahl is doing you're yeah, seeing a lot Man of versus machine does a lot of that yeah and you're seeing a lot of people building their own custom solvers so that's the first thing we do is show you how that works how the data flows how you build your own solver that way and then from there we extrapolate and we start building our own particle system using that solver SOP. So we're starting to add points and we show how to keep track of the lifetime of the points and then um, how to add velocities and integrate velocity and position and actually start to move stuff around. And then we add our own forces. So we write our own forces in there. And then finally, we do collisions. We actually write our own collision detection algorithm and start bouncing our own particles off of stuff. Uh, so we're really just learning the you know, what's going on under the hood of the particle solver in Houdini, because you're going to get into problems. It's going to happen when you're working with stuff and knowing what's happening is amazing. It's like, you know, driving a car and knowing how to fix your own engine. You know, you don't have to hire the mechanic, you know, everything that's happening there. Um, so that's kind of what's going on in that first lesson. And okay. that one's, that one's pretty dense. I will say that, but it's a lot of really good information. And then when we get to the second one, we kind of get to take a little breather and we actually start learning the fundamental tools of Houdini's particles. So all the built-in stuff and we kind of tackle it node by node and go through all the settings and we talk about some of the, um, I won't call them gotchas, but things that people end up with problems and not know how to solve. Like when you have an emitter that's moving really fast mm -hmm. and you see gaps between the particles. So we talk about how to get rid of the gaps between the particles okay. and how to make things really smooth and get good sampling and, and really understand what a lot of these settings are doing and how they're influencing your simulation. And then the third lesson is all about art direction. So okay. it it's more like, okay, you know how to use the tools. Now I'm going to show you how to actually make this stuff look good and how to make it look organic and how to flow things from one system to another and um, one set of, uh, you know, parameters to another set of parameters. So we do some things where we're, we're transitioning from groups to groups and working on how that can be seamless um, in all different ways to arc direct particles. And then the fourth one, now that we have all this stuff animated and we've got these little points we need to know what to do with them how are we going to output them how are we going to render them how can we put geometry on them so we go through all the varieties of ways of actually rendering the stuff build some of our own custom shaders um just really kind of you know get you the full spectrum of knowledge about outputting particles here so what at the end of the at the end of the course do you do you end up with um, like a portfolio piece or, or is it more about, um, sort of understanding the different tools in Houdini that will allow you to go on your own and build that piece 
do you do like do you is it a fine do you end up with a final project basically the final assignment is for a project okay yes so we have my apprentices who are still working on that um they've both shown me some work in progress which is looking super cool uh and they're just wanting to really finish it up and make it look great so those guys are working hard um but i think it's going to be really cool when they post that stuff up yeah, one one of your apprentices is a uh, surgeon, and I'm just going to very very quickly um, show some of his work to because he uses Houdini quite often, um, and yeah. I believe like here you see the side effects. So I'm I'm thinking this was done in Houdini, and surgeon yeah. has been on on a couple streams um, in the past, and. He's been showing the crazy, uh, some of the crazy results you can you can get out of uh, Houdini if you if you have an understanding of um, the tools that are that are available to you and um, it always looks more intim intimidating than it is and I guess this is this is where a course like your first core course Houdini fundamentals and Houdini particles it's sort of it helps you navigate through the software so that you sort of just learn what you need to learn to get started. It's like Photoshop. Most of us use Photoshop, but most of us probably use 20% of it to get most of our work done. Um, that's, that's the, the, the beauty of having, having a course like this sort of show you the best tools and how to, how to get to that specific result you're looking for without getting lost in, in the multitude of, of, uh, of buttons, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, one other thing I want to mention since we're talking about the apprentices a little bit, we had Sir John and we had Ryan Cashman yeah. and during my conversations with them, we got into a lot of like side stuff, tangential stuff about how simulation environments work and how to, integrate rigid bodies and particles and custom solvers and stuff and we really started to exploit some of the power of houdini that you just can't do in other programs um so there's some really interesting discussions for anybody who signs up um hopefully you guys watch the conversations we had there's a lot of a lot of material that's outside of the realm of particles but um it was uh, it was really really great to talk to those guys and share the stuff that they did they were both really dedicated students and uh, awesome, you know, super happy to work with them. Um, Adam, I'm going to actually share um, your portfolio if that's okay. Yeah. All right. So this is this is Adam's portfolio. I don't know if is there any project in particular um, you 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 want to talk about that that could just give people who let's say don't know about Houdini or don't understand exactly what particles are just to give them uh like i guess a basic understanding and then um like we'll we'll talk about the course a little more sure um if you want we could actually pull up my vimeo page that has a houdini reel on it so every single piece on there is houdini okay and that might be cool for people to see so um, vimeo yeah if you just look up adam swab vimeo perfect and then uh so oh, yeah. can... I have a Vimeo link right there. So which you, you have scroll down a little bit. Spider. Yeah, scroll, scroll down a little bit. You have Keep your Houdini reel. It's going to be a little bit lower than that. Okay. There it is on the bottom left. Houdini reel 2016. Okay. Let's do this. With the metal wires. just taking a minute to to load so every project that's that are in this reel are made with houdini yes this is all houdini um and this uh, by now is a year old so there's a whole year's worth of projects that aren't included on here but this runs the gamut i mean there's stuff from particles to rigid bodies to explosions to what i'd call non-traditional effects on here um there's all kinds of stuff Let's see if we can get it to actually play. Uh, it's having a bit of a hard time. Um, yeah, you may have to 
bump the settings down or something like that. Yeah, let me actually try that. Uh, I'll put it at 780p. Reload. And hopefully that will do. All right, perfect. There we go. So why, you know, why would someone go for Houdini for particles in Houdini and, and what is the difference between between uh, X particles, let's say in Cinema 4D and the sort of work you can do in Houdini? I've never used X particles, so I absolutely cannot answer that. Um, probably talking to Ryan Cashman, I think might be a better, give you a better answer there because I think he's done both of those. Um, but for me, Houdini, at least what I can do with it, number one, it can handle millions and millions of particles super easily. So for me, just quantity is an issue. And then the other thing is how does it play with the rest of the environment that's going on in Houdini? So you can actually have particles that are influencing rigid bodies that are influencing fluid and smoke and all this stuff kind of playing really well and really naturally together. And that's part of the reason that I like it. It's like a, a limitless thing. And you can also hack apart anything. So you can open up the solvers that are already in there and add your own custom stuff in there, um, which is part of what a lot of people do. Um, once you get higher level with that stuff, you're kind of constantly breaking things apart and adding your own stuff in and making it work the way you want it to work. Um, to me, like when I worked with Cinema 4D, it was such a closed system mm -hmm. and wasn't a good system and when I wanted to add my own thing I had no choice but to write a C++ plugin okay which is not very cool to do that whereas Houdini is just a bunch of nodes and you can just com combine nodes however you want and put them together and make something new out of them or you can start writing your own tools and vex or vops or whatever it is that you want to do it's just much much easier you have access to data that's just hidden to you in the other programs yeah, I remember um, you mentioned Simon Holmedal. Um, I remember he he had a presentation, a talk, in which he was comparing, he was basically saying that was his reason uh, that that moved him to, to uh, Houdini because a lot of the stuff he was trying to do with uh, Expresso in Cinema 4D was sort of limited, whereas in Houdini, you sort of had access to all this raw data that enabled you to do all sorts of um, craziness in a way. Yes. Yeah, like this next one that's about to play. Here's an example of me taking fluid simulations and bringing that into, um, into the SOPS context and doing some kind of interesting shading and stuff like that. That would be very, very hard to do out of Cinema 4D. Um, there's just a bunch of like little random stuff. Probably if you keep, keep stuff playing, you'll just see a bunch of random weird tests and things going on here. Yeah, so this is something that's, I don't know if people can tell that this is interesting or not, but to me it is. It's an attempt to actually texture map a fluid simulation, which if you know what's going on technically, fluid simulations don't actually output UV coordinates that are stable. So there's all kinds of custom things that are happening in there to try to act actual image map onto a, a thing that doesn't actually have UV coordinates. Um, so just kind of crazy stuff that you'd never be able to do um, in other packages. Okay. Um, you've mentioned SOP. D does it send, stand for something? Is it an acronym? Yeah. Or? Yeah. Surface operators. Okay. So everything in there has like an op after it. So you have COPS, which are compositing operators, and then SOPs, which are sur surface operators. And then DOPS, which are dynamics operators, POPs, particle operators, ROPs, render operators. So anytime that you hear an OP, something with an OP at the end of it, it's standing for some context in Houdini. That's um, basically Houdini is kind of broken down into almost like a file system, like a directory structure. Mm -hmm. And it's it, it doesn't actually enforce any organization on you which okay. a lot of people will find frustrating because you can do things like put a material uh, system inside a simulation environment mm -hmm. and just hide it there and then 
hide a render system in there as well. You can do all kinds of crazy things. It it just doesn't tell you where to put anything. Um, that's kind of an interesting thing. That's one thing that makes it really, um, really powerful. Like I just delivered an asset for a client. They wanted to be able to have a fluid simulation thing with a bunch of custom settings and custom stuff in it. But I just delivered it to them and the asset did everything. So all they had to do was pick an object and say, this is my emitter, and then pick an object that said, this is the thing it's going to collide with. And the asset set up the entire simulation environment, set up the simulation, and even had a render tab on it. So as soon as they were done with the simulation, all they had to do was click a button that said render, and it would just click out or send out all the images. And they never had to dive into anything in Houdini. All they had to do was just stay up at the top level and play with the asset, and it did everything for them. Um, and it's not terribly complicated to put that stuff together. Um, it's a, I mean, I'm kind of an evangelist for the program because I think it's so, so powerful um, and so limitless for what you can do. How, how's the learning curve though? Is it, is it something that, because the, the thing we hear about Houdini, at least from my perspective, um, is that it's so powerful. It's such a powerful tool um, that, that, you can almost do anything, uh, anything with it. So in terms of learning what you need to do, um, I guess just to get started, how, how steep is the learning curve? It's very steep. And the reason, one of the big reasons for it is that people are coming to Houdini from another 3D package. So they already have a mindset about how they're working and how they want to work and how a 3D program works. And Houdini is a complete paradigm shift and it can be really tough for people to adjust to that. So that's one of the reasons why we do that foundation class and why I recommend that is to, to introduce that paradigm shift and get you into a different way of thinking. Um, you know, this is all about proceduralism, right? It, you have to build things in a way that's more about creating a a procedure to build things rather than building the actual thing that's kind of what i talk about here it's like a non-destructive workflow mm -hmm. and it means that you're not going to be doing traditional box modeling and poly modeling and sculpting like you would in zbrush yeah. so you have to kind of get that mindset out and you have to use this tool for what it does well you know i won't tell you that you're going to use this for every single task that you need to do in the 3d pipeline i think that's that's silly anyway um you know, ZBrush does what ZBrush does, and ZBrush does it great. Mm -hmm. And then there are modeling programs that, you know, you can poly model and box model as well, and it does great for that. But when you're looking to do something that's completely procedural, and you can make changes upstream and have that reflected downstream and really kind of get into some um, stuff that would be much, much harder to do in, in Maya, like trying to keep your entire construction history for yeah. a project yeah. and then go back and adjust something and hope it doesn't break something. That's, that's impossible for Maya, but for Houdini, that's kind of what it is. And that's the mindset that you have to get into when you're using the program. So it's about a paradigm shift, really. So the entire workflow is, is non-destructive. Like you can go back to basically any of these nodes and and change the settings and it'll it'll re, it'll sort of reflect in your in your system or in your simulation if you've done it right okay there are always there are always gotchas there are always that's part of the thing is you have to understand what you're doing and how what you're doing potentially can affect what you're doing downstream okay so if you if you do things like like box modeling and you start pulling out polygons and doing weird things and you're using viewport interactions then it's going to be recording the like the primitive number that you adjusted, which is fine. But if you change the model, mm -hmm. then that primitive number changes and all your other changes get, you know, reflected downstream and it's not going to be consistent. You're not going to have consistent results. So it's about ad adjusting methodology and the way you work. Um, but think about this, like this is how you can kick shots out really quickly in a production environment is that you've built a tool and you've built it smart and you built it in a way that, is adaptable mm -hmm. and then when somebody says you know what i know that we made this dinosaur explode but uh the director changed his mind and now it's going to be a rubber pig okay you don't have to do anything other than swap one model out for the next and then the whole system is going to work you know and that's great 
if you were back in Cinema 4D, you'd have to kind of redo everything. Um, or if you were in my age, you'd have to redo almost everything and reconnect nodes and do all kinds of crazy stuff here. It's just swap one node out for the other node and then almost everything continues to work. Because it's, it's, it's working, it's using the data of the model, not the model itself. Yes. Okay, okay. There's, there's, um, you have a lesson that's focused on rendering. Can you talk a little bit about rendering in Houdini? Well, this is all based on Mantra. Um, so there are a bunch of other renderers out there. There's Redshift and Arnold, and they're developing V-Ray. But all the stuff that I'm doing is based on Mantra, which is obviously the integrated render in Houdini. Mm -hmm. And because it's integrated, it does everything. Um, it's what's called a raise renderer, which stands for render everything you ever saw. Okay. Uh, it's uh, it's kind of similar to RenderMan in terms of its functionality, but they keep updating it with kind of new features. So right now the renderer is a physically based renderer, um, which means it's very accurate and gives very realistic results. Mm -hmm in the material system as well as a physically based material system. Um, so all of that's great for doing realistic stuff, but because it's a render engine that's meant to take in everything to do volumes and volume scattering and indirect, you know, reflections and refractions and bounces and GI and everything like that. And to do it without any cheats, it, um, it's a bit on the slow side. So if what you're doing is putting a Chrome sphere in a scene with an endless environment and just clicking render you're going to be pretty disappointed that it renders so slow but if you try to render you know two billion polygons you know instanced of some crazy geometry like a car mm -hmm. um you're going to be really impressed because you're going to say holy crap my other render engine would choke if i tried to hit hit it with that um so it's great with massive massive data sets it's great with incredibly complex geometry but if you're just trying to do basic stuff or you're trying to do an interior rendering i think you'll be pretty upset um so i'd say measured expectations okay uh but redshift seems to be getting a lot of ground these days i know um like simon who we mentioned before was using redshift quite a bit and i think a lot of artists who are working independently are using redshift too yeah um, I'm, i've been hearing a lot of good things about it um i know chad ashley who who's uh the creative director at um grayscale gorilla uh has used v-ray octane um and a couple other and arnold he he's been giving arnold tutorials but he's talking mostly about redshift and and that seems to be one of uh one of the render engines he's been really uh enjoying lately um one question in the chat was uh, someone was asking what sort of uh machine do you need to to be able to render these complex simulations like is there is there a minimum setup that's sort of required or um it depends on how complex the simulation yeah it depends on how on how complex so you have to remember that anything you're rendering needs to be stored in ram yeah so there's a question of how much data are you actually writing out mm -hmm. that needs to be kept in your system in RAM so that it can be rendered. Um, just so you know, this entire tutorial system was re recorded on a like 2012 MacBook Pro. Okay. Um, you know, it was the top of the line MacBook Pro, but that was five years ago. This and entire it's... tutorial right now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So I have eight gigs of RAM and I've got whatever you know, hardware was in that. Um, and I don't consider this enough really to send out animations, but mm -hmm. to send out test frames and stuff is not a problem. Mm -hmm. um, my work computer is 64 gigs of RAM, which I kind of routinely hit the limit of. And uh, I'm not really sure what the, the processors are, but it's a pretty powerful processor. Um, the other thing too, is if you find that rendering is an issue, there's always services like grid markets or, um, Zinc, Google Zinc, and then yeah. you have, uh, I think, a couple other services out there that you can use to render that are fairly affordable. Okay. So yeah, that's impressive. I, for, you know, I thought you would have told me, you know, you have a computer with like 128 gigs, 
of RAM with like 10, 1080 TIs and whatever not. No, no, not at all. Not at all. I think all my, I mean, even my work computer only has one video card in it. Um, I mean, what Houdini really wants is one good video card. I think it was like preferably Intel, if I remember right, or NVIDIA, sorry, preferably an NVIDIA card. Um, they're pretty finicky. It's pretty finicky with your video card and your video card settings. So I do recommend people check the minimum requirements on SideFX website just to make sure that's compatible. Um, most crashes that people experience with the interface are going to be video card incompatibilities. I'm just going to share the side effect website with people in the chat. Whoops, that's not what I wanted to do. Let me just paste the right one. All right. Here it is. Um, this is really, it's, I, I haven't, I don't think I've ever, oh, I've ever opened um, Houdini in my life, but this all looks really, really um, appealing to me. Just the idea that um, the non-destructive workflow, the idea that I can create a system, drop in a geomet, like a, an object that I can sort of later down the line just swap for a different thing to but still be able to keep that that uh sort of same simulation like sounds really awesome um whenever i see uh simon like the the first the first intro he did for industry workshops which was just a simple cube with like the 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 surface of it sort of crumpling and and changing and and so on and it was something he did with houdini but just that thing he did like went viral at one point like everyone sort of using you started seeing that same effect happen everywhere the the sort of um simulation they have for a lot of the nike shoes they work on uh mm -hmm. where where you basically have um, the surface of an object like shift into the shoe or shift into a different uh, material is it's always mind-blowing whenever like there's no way you you watch those type of simulations and you're not impressed by by the result that you get yeah absolutely I mean Simon's an example of somebody who he pushes it kind of as hard as he can um, I mean he's incredibly incredibly inspiring um, for sure. If people don't know uh, who Simon Holmedal is, he's uh, back in the days, he used to do tutorials for um, Grayscale Gorilla in, in uh, Expresso and, and Cinema 4D, but now he's doing like some of the craziest, like they worked on um, uh, the, the, how'd you call it? The promo video for Cinema 4D. Yeah. Um, which, which uh, interestingly enough, they used a lot of Houdini for. <laughs> and and I'll just play this for a second, and it'll just give you an idea of the power uh, of Houdini. Can you like with those simulations? Like I'm I'm just looking at this video. Like things like fur, things like uh, hair, are those things you can also sort of work with when you're working with uh, uh, particles? Is that something considered? Uh, a particle in Houdini. No, hair is its own system, and it goes through a um, a wire solver. But you can integrate stuff. So they were showing some great examples in the version sixteen point five uh, videos for Houdini that had fur systems interacting with fluids. So they had a squirrel getting wet and shaking off the water and stuff like that. Okay. And that's super exciting, super cool that you can integrate those two. Uh, the first system in Houdini is pretty good from what I've seen. Um, I don't do a lot of character TD work, so I wouldn't comment too much about it, but the results I've seen are really good. I mean, especially if you get a grooming artist who knows what they're doing, Yeah. which is what, yeah, so the stuff that's on the screen right now, that's all Houdini Diffusion Limited Aggregation, which is a trend um, which you're kind of seeing all over the place now. Uh, yeah, that's one other thing about the Houdini community um, is that you'll see a lot of people sharing files and sharing techniques. It's a really, really open community and very helpful. Um, so if you do get involved with the software, 
you're going to find a lot of people who love sharing their tips and their techniques and, and kind of coming together to solve problems. I'm just going to replay the video just because it's that awesome. Um, people in the chat, if you guys have any questions about Houdini uh, or about the course or just questions you'd like to do, uh, direct to Adam, uh, feel free to ask them in the chat and I'll, I'll convey them. Um, yeah, I've got the chat window up too. I can see it. Okay, cool. Uh, Adam, like, I'm just going to run very quickly um, in your first Houdini course. So what, basically, what do you learn from this one? And can you take then to, to uh, can you transpose to the new course that you have? Sure. The first one is all about getting you comfortable with the interface and the parameters and the concepts of procedural design. Um, we go all the way from you knowing nothing to you being able to build an image just like the one that's uh, displayed at the beginning there. Um, okay. Minus, I think, a little bit of the, the compositing aspects of it. Um, but what we're really doing there is building up to doing this kind of insane Greeble tool that um, can start taking in all kinds of complex geometry and, you know, putting it onto your objects and really um, uh, adapting to whatever you you put in there so that you do get that full procedural workflow. Yeah, I've seen some incredible results. Um, a lot of a lot of the students, a lot of your students who who sort of use the same concepts as as a, almost like raw data to do matte paintings or or landscapes in concept art and things like that really impressive work yeah yeah so here we're showing exactly like this tool adapts to the surface of any object that you have there and is automatically going to place stuff correctly and orient it correctly um then show you how to make variation and add your own coloration coloration onto it uh i know there's a breakdown of this image too in terms of how that's created and is like in in the new course do you actually render a video of your simulation or is it mostly um uh static images um well that's for the the person who is doing it to decide okay. um but no th this isn't the type of course where you follow along with me and okay. you're going to create the exact same image that i make it's much more open-ended um, I kind of like people to self-direct a little bit in terms of that stuff because I feel like, you know, you need to, I won't say like push yourself in a direction, but you should take yourself in the direction you're most interested in. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have something that you want to do, whether it's like, I want to make a perfect system that does raindrops and, you know, really get photo real with this, or I want to make some kind of, you know, really crazy Nike shoe kind of thing you know, you can do that. The flexibility is there. I don't want to, I don't want to necessarily tell people you're going to come out of this when everybody's going to have the exact same project that looks exactly the same. Um, I just prefer to be more open-ended about giving out assignments. Yeah. And that, that also helps, um, within the community because, um, one thing, one thing we're trying to do, uh, with the courses, um, cause in the first, in the first courses that, that were out, you sometimes, uh, see a lot of work that repeats itself and things like that. So that's also one thing we've been trying to do, uh, in terms of the assignments, uh, to make sure that people actually go in and find their own voices, uh, when doing the, when doing the assignments, um, just so that they can end up with a, with a portfolio piece or a final project they're actually proud of, um, where, where they actually learn something for themselves. Yeah. I mean, I think if you want to do this professionally, you want to do it for a living, you have to have that kind of motivation to be passionate about what you're doing and, and kind of self start a little bit. And that type of stuff shows when you're looking at people's reels and their portfolios, you can, you can see who's following along with the tutorial and who's actually you know, kind of pushing themselves forward to do their own thing in their own voice. Mm -hmm. 
I'm just going back to the lessons just to to sort of explore some of the the content of it so in in lesson one so you talk about the sops uh you have a lesson a chapter called home homemade particles um what what do you talk about in that is that the first time that you we start to sort of analyze the anatomy of a system how mm -hmm. okay yes yep so that's where we're actually starting in learning what makes a particle move um you know you have to you have to understand that a particle is only a point in space that's it and unless you're adding forces and unless you're understanding how to convert those forces into a new position every single frame you have a point that's just going to sit there so that's kind of where we start is how do we how do we move a point um how do we animate that how do we make that obey the laws of physics Yeah, you're right. being cool to us or not cool. <laughs> and at the end of each lesson, you have your your homework assignment. And I'm guessing mm -hmm. they, they build up on each other, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not the same. It's not the type of thing where homework one is going to extend into homework two is going to extend into homework three. Mm -hmm. It doesn't it doesn't build to a final like that. What it does is you're doing an exercise to solidify your knowledge every week. So that's really the only way to do it is you have to, you have to solidify your knowledge. You have to go through repetition. Um, you have to, you know, do things on your own a little bit, fail, go back and see what you did wrong and then fix it. And, you know, maybe that's, that's my way of doing it, which maybe yeah. is a little br brutal, but um, I've found that repetition is kind of the only way to learn anything especially in a technical piece of software. You're not going to learn it just by watching and you're not going to learn it just by doing it once. You kind of have to True. do it three or four or five times until it becomes a little more instinctual. Yeah. And then hopefully what I'm doing in the class here is making you understand what is happening. So it's not just like, okay, well, I guess these are the steps I take. It's, oh, I understand why I took those steps. And then it becomes a little more, uh, a little easier for you to grasp. Yeah. It it uh, it definitely looks impressive and and um it's always hard to find good tutorials when it comes to particle simulations uh like a lot of a lot of the time they're very specific it's like a a step by step tutorial so you end up doing something that replicates exactly what the final the final project of someone else's final project so being able to have you know that learning path that shows you sort of how why do things interact or 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 work a certain way to give you that open-endedness to to go in and sort of experiment with your own ideas and whatever or not uh is going to be pretty powerful um so i think is there anything else you'd like to add uh adam where where uh i think we've covered pretty much the entire course and just so you guys know we're actually having uh our holiday sales uh starting now so you can actually go and grab adam's course uh houdini particles with 15 percent off and if this is something you're really interested in but don't have as much experience in houdini you can go and check out his um first course called houdini fundamentals uh, where he sort of teaches you the tools and, and um, sort of how to get started with Houdini. So any of those classes uh, will give you the solid tools that you need to create um, like really nice and advanced uh, particle simulation. If you're a fan of man versus machine, this is how the, the sausage is made pretty much. Yeah, let me see if there's any questions to answer here on mine. I'm just going to scroll back just a little bit and see. Um, let's see. VRAM limitations become more of a problem with crazy scenes in Houdini. I have no idea. Um, does Houdini take advantage of GPU and CPU for rendering? Right now, only CPU. Uh, GPU if you are using Redshift or I don't think Octane works with it. But, uh, oh yeah, Octane may, but Redshift, 
for sure you can do GPU rendering. And then I don't know if Arnold GPU rendering is integrated yet. Uh, uh, I don't think so yet. I might be wrong, but I I know V-Ray is developing um, a plugin for Houdini, but I think Arnold is still CPU, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that, it might be. Um, let's see, whole scene of tribal dude coming out of the floor with lots of characters doing lots of stuff around was all done in Houdini. Yeah, no, it's... all the all the environment stuff was done in Houdini, um, and all the stylization of the characters was done in Houdini for that one. But the animation for that was out of Maya. You have a uh, you have a great question here from Tim. Um, where is it? It's one of the last ones. I'd be no, interested let's... to know more about your working relationship. Can you see that one? Yep. Tim's with the rest of the, with the rest of the team on the types of project he works on as a Houdini artist. I don't know anything about how that works. Well, typically I'm working in a very small team, so I might only be the only Houdini artist on the team, or I'll be one of maybe two or three people. Um, usually we have some lead time ahead, so I'm developing systems and I'm developing assets and then I'm supervising the rest of the team, kind of fixing anything that gets broken along the way and more or less art directing and guiding people into using the tools. Um, that's kind of how I'm working with other artists there. Um, a lot of times I'm directing projects, so when I'm directing stuff, it's a little easier just because I'm not translating stuff between a director and myself and other artists. I'm just doing what I think is right. Um, when I work with uh, directors, like I've worked a lot with Andy Wang, um, for him it's a lot of, I'd say, um, I get involved a lot with the creative stuff with him where he'll have a creative brief and he will sometimes draw sketches about what he's looking for, but then I've worked kind of hand in hand with him to develop visual language for stuff and develop tests, um, you know, because he'll have an idea in his head, but it'll be, you know, very open to interpretation mm -hmm. uh, about what it might be. So we're usually working together to kind of come up with something that works well there. Um, yeah, that's pretty much about it. You know, we have Maya artists that we work with, but most of what we're doing there is just passing data back and forth. You know, I'm getting Alembics and caches from them, and then I'm, I'm passing them my own caches back, or sometimes I'm rent just rendering out my own elements and passing that stuff straight on to comp. That's pretty much it. Like how a Houdini artist works in a professional setting. Um, yeah, you know, I work in a small studio. I'm the only staff Houdini artist there. I've worked at DD before for a little while, um, which was a totally different thing. But, you know, depend, depends what you're talking about. If you're talking about motion graphics or if you're talking about, um, like, at a real effects pipeline. Because um, traditional effects pipeline, I really couldn't tell you because even when I worked at DD, I was working on Tron and we were part of a really small team working with Gmunk and it was like four or five of us that were left to our own devices and pretty much answered directly to Joe Kaczynski um, without a lot of people in between us, which is very unusual for an effects pipeline. Um, so I haven't really been a part of that, I, I'd have to say. Um, let's see, how often are you the pipeline versus building tools for other people? Um, yeah, I think that was kind of just answered there, which is mostly I'm doing stuff for myself, but you know, three or four times a year, we get projects that we bring in other artists for. Uh, oh, be ran on Octane. Just in the course around spring 2018, March or something, Adam will be okay to ask questions, or if I'm stuck, if that's okay, I won't have the mentorship. Uh, that's a question for the Learn Squared folks because they give you access to forums and stuff like that. And if people are asking questions on the forums, I'm going to try to pop in and do what I can to answer them. But my number one priority during the term is going to be to the apprentices. Yeah. Um, so that's the answer there is if I can answer, I will. But I, I have the priority of working with the apprentices first. Generally, um just so you know whenever whenever you buy a course you have access to to um so for instance houdini particles um you can get it as the basics which is just the videos you can also get the learn squared package where you have access to the to the course lesson like the entire course but also uh, recordings of the the mentorship sessions recording of the apprentice sessions and reviews and that sort of gives you 
extra material. Generally, if you're stuck when you're starting to learn uh, this stuff and you get stuck, there's a big chance that one of the students uh, that's going through the professional apprenticeship or one of the apprentices has gone through that. And generally through the recording um, of their processes, you, you might get, you get those questions answered. And you also have access to uh, our Discord group where, you know, there's ton of, tons of um, professionals, uh, advanced hobbyists and so on who are generally um, able to, to, answers, to answer some of the questions you have. Surjan can definitely help you with Houdini. Tim Zarki, you know, he's that, he might be, he's further along the, the path, I'd say, in Houdini. So there's a, a couple students like that who have more experience with the software that can, if not solve your issue, at least point you to a right direction um, to, to find the answer you need. Um, on that note, uh, Adam, if you have any last uh, comment or, or thing you'd like to share, uh, it's been about an hour, so we, we, can, we can get to, to the closing of the stream. All right. I uh, just want to say I'm really proud of the course, proud of doing this again with Learn Squared. Uh, the first course I thought was really successful. I think this one, again, is a whole lot of learning, and um, it's the course that I wish I could have taken when I was learning this stuff. So that is my, uh, my closing words, I would say, is I, I think it's good, but you know that's going to be up for you guys to decide, obviously. Um, but yeah, to me, it's, it's everything that I would have wanted just going and starting and learning this stuff. So I'm super proud and happy to share the information out there with everybody else. Yeah, if you if you guys are interested in learning Houdini, learning simulations and particles in Houdini, Adam is the guy to go to. He's got a ton of experience teaching this stuff, uh, not just with Learn Squared, but he's been teaching it for a while. These are his latest courses. Jump on it. Enjoy the 50% holiday uh, sale we're having. Um, and bite for yourself, bite for your friend, bite for your parents, bite for someone. And, uh, yeah, happy holidays, everyone. And thank you. Thank you for, for, uh, coming to the stream. We'll catch you soon. Adam, we once, uh, what we could do actually just before we wrap up is, uh, Sir Jan and Ryan, once, once, um, they're further along, uh, the apprenticeship, perhaps we could have another stream with, one of them or both and and uh and basically show their their progress throughout the course that might be that might be something interesting to do yeah i think that'd be a great conversation to have okay so so that's coming up in the new year and we uh, adam are you going to to open uh mentorship uh seats for for the course yeah i believe so okay. isn't that i think that's uh i think that's expected yeah yeah, I just know that you you had a you have you know you have a new baby, so I don't know how. But anyhow, that's going to happen. So you'll be able to purchase the Learn Squared package, the professional package, and like I said, take advantage of the fifteen percent off. And we'll see you another time. Have a good one, guys. All right, thank you, everybody. Ciao.